Welcome to the first of these podcasts. I'm Graham Hunter. Over time, we're going to be speaking in this forum to people that make me excited about football. Football excites and unites all of us. And the reason that we're going to be speaking to a variety of different people of different ages, nationalities, some who play the sport, some who just appreciate the sport like you and I do, is because they make us passionate or they make us understand it better. Or maybe from some of their memories spent in sport, mostly football, they'll make us laugh too. Um, For me, it's a pleasure and an indulgence because I'm going to be speaking to people I admire. And we started with Gary Neville, um, somebody who I've always admired, his attitude, his behaviour, his leadership, the fact that he was matching Sir Alex Ferguson, who I grew up um, learning from in Aberdeen and I've followed as a journalist throughout my career. And I feel that Gary Neville is literally changing the landscape of football in Britain with the brilliance of his analysis and his repetitive ability to break complicated things down and make them simple and interesting. So we began when he was in a good mood, admittedly, just after uh, the Manchester United-Manchester City derby. And we spoke about his life, what makes him interested in football, cricket. And we spoke also about his appreciation, his changing appreciation of Barcelona. And it went a little bit like this. Because we're talking about quality, because we're talking about broadcasting, I chose to start by seeing whether you shared a wee sense of loss that I had when I heard the other day that Richie Benno had died. Mm. Because thinking back, aside from him being exceptionally good at his job, he was one of the voices of my childhood, and I'm dramatically yeah. older than you. So if we listen to him, then we listen to him at different ages and different times. But did you listen to him? And, yeah. and when he went, did it catch you and think, there's one of the greats? Go yeah, I, I absolutely did. And I, I, I'm not one of those people. When someone dies, I, I didn't... Um, I don't tweet out about it. I know a lot of people do and I have no problem with it, but I tend not to because I I think you've probably been tweeting out about it every single day. But I absolutely love Test cricket. I played cricket from the age of five through to 18 until um, the UT manager at United stopped me. And even now, I'm not a fan of 2020. I'm not a fan of 50 over cricket. However, I can sit there for six, seven hours all day long listening and watching to not at times a lot happening. But the intrigue of it, the endurance of it, and obviously Richie Benno was an incredible commentator, um, a voice that you just seem to recognise um, if you're a great cricket fan, as I was, and you would never get tired of listening to him. And I think that, yeah, you look at, he will be probably the most memorable cricket commentator you think of voices in other sports that have sort of captured the imagination of everybody and you associate with that sport and that's I suppose in some ways makes me feel the responsibility of what I do because in football in professional football when I was a football player you'd think oh punditry or the pundits or the commentators you don't pay a lot of attention to them in some ways sometimes you even think well are they that no we're the ones that are important the managers the coaches the players but actually in terms of adding the colour to it for the for the people who are watching the supporters it's a vital job it's a big responsibility because People think of the 1966 World Cup final goal and they remember the commentary over it as much as they actually do um, the goal. And they think of the Aguero goal and Martin's Aguero. And City fans have got that over their shirts. You think of in uh, 99, we always think, will Manchester United score? They always score. You know, And those lines make give you a little tingle, particularly when you were part of it in 1999. And you think... Uh, you know, commentary adds big moments to things and the responsibility that, let's say, someone like Richie Benno had all those years um, doing what he did and f- filling all that space but never becoming tired of him. So it's a great responsibility, really, when you look at it. What he shared with you, which younger people won't remember, is that Richie was a brilliant captain, a brilliant cricketer, mm. a leader of Australia when they were winning the Ashes or trying to win them back. And I think that's one of the things that... I know you've mentioned Martin and maybe Clive Tildesley, who, who never played top, top-level sport... But we're here because I've always believed that you, you add another dimension to the way in which football is not just analysed or co-commentated, but then talked about and taken away by other kids or coaches or whatever. So before I talk to you about what it is that you do with such specialism, such skill, when you were growing up or when you were a junior footballer, who was doing 
these kind of things in football in written form or radio or television that influenced you? Maybe not. There was no sky, mm -hmm. so it's a different no. thing. But when you were when you were absorbing all the information you could do about cricket or yeah. football, who, who stuck out to you? I think probably Hanson. You'd have to say Hanson, I would think, in terms of sort of quote punditry. I don't particularly like the word, but you know, Hanson for me, he was a. You only recognise how important someone is when they've gone, and you look at now the loss to match of the day since he left. He was holding it together on that side of the show. Obviously, you had the presenter Gary Lineker doing it, or the ones before him. But Hanson was—he gave it that strength, that 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 presence, authority. Um, and I think to me, because he'd been a serial winner, um, that Liverpool team had dominated the 70s and 80s. And as much to my pain, because I was a Manchester United fan. But then he had a presence. Everything he said, you felt, carried strength. So for me, it was probably Hansen, I would say, was the sort of dominant pundit. And then Andy Gray came along. I think on commentary, Andy Gray was fantastic. And, you know, he's memorable, you know, what, what he did in games in terms of the way in which he delivered things. Um, but I think in terms of punditry, it would have been Hansen, would have been the one that I would have looked at. I think in football... I would have looked up at and said, yeah, he, he's, he's got the most credibility. He's the one that you'd look at. It, it fascinates me that you got round to saying that you said authority, because clearly in that medium, the BBC is, gives you a shorter amount of time on yeah. air than, than you get, and therefore there's a different discipline, and therefore you can say less, and it's the, yeah. it chops along, and it always has. And also in television and radio, I don't think there was a culture for pure in-depth analysis I think there was a yeah. if you said this was wrong this was right this is why that's happened his authority carried that through but I remember I mean, it's, it, it, it's, it's difficult to talk about Andy in the same light because his career changed suddenly And but I remember Luca Vialli when he was sat at Chelsea and I was invited around to his house for an interview and he said I'm not going to go on I'm, not, I'm, I'm going to go to Italy I'm going to do for Italy what Andy Gray has done for Britain mm. and I was shocked at that type yeah. of phrase he said in Italy we only get criticism the referee's an idiot or they didn't defend properly yeah. or the 4-1 the one goal and he said I want to he's, you're unaware of how much he's changed the debate here so that's what you're talking about with Andy rather than Alan that there was yeah. more time to describe that yeah. Sky was a growing medium and yeah, yeah. it's one of the things you've inherited that it encourages depth yeah. of analysis I, I think punditry in my childhood and my probably early playing careers was incident led it was a moment in a game, a sending off, an offside decision, a goal, a bad mistake. So it was incident led. When I came into, I don't look at a game. I, I, goals don't interest me, and that sounds really daft. That thing to say. The you know last week with the Charles Adam goal that scored from 56 yards, fantastic, but it doesn't interest me. I've got no interest in it. it, it, it I, I get bored of it very quickly. Someone said to me, you know, show me. Break that goal down for me, Gary. I couldn't do it. I'd just run it in. I'd run it in full speed and say, great goal. Well done. Because everybody at home can see how he's done it, what the goal is, and I'm not telling them anything they don't know. So I, I, don't, I don't treat the fan as, a, as an idiot. You've just reintroduced Richie Benner, whose motto always was, don't tell them the yeah. they can already see. Tell them more. Yeah, and, and so for me, I was more interested in how and why rather than the incident. So rather than what happened being the incident is... How was a game won? Why was a game won? And sometimes that's the thing that interests me. And I think that when I went into to, to punditry, I, I always thought of the game quite analytically. I was lucky enough to play under great managers. I was lucky enough to play under even lots of Terry Venables, who's somebody who brought the game down into its, into its individual parts. So when I looked at the game, when I look at a game on a Monday night or over a weekend... I'm thinking which manager is outwitting the other manager, which player is doing something that's making the other player uncomfortable, and what impact is that having upon the game, and how could it have been stopped? So it's not just a case of what happened, how did it happen, how could they have stopped it, and closing the loop. So you're actually informing people at home about the whole process, rather than just saying he got on top of him uh, in the game, and he was better than him in the game, and what a fantastic performance, yet... Yeah. But how did he go about it, and how could it have been stopped? So you actually, and that's that's the way I always find that they're the bits I find interesting because they're the problems I always felt that on the pitch I was asked to solve. You know, how do you stop Robert Perez coming into a little pocket of space, Thierry Henry flying round one side of your shoulder, and Ashley Cole overlapping? How could how do how do you stop that? But at, <clears throat> at what point in your life? Um, 
football, not cricket, did you realise that you had this analytical ability? That's, you probably didn't think mm -hmm. about it as analytical then. You, you, you built your career, you were very determined, you had a certain skill set, but your brain evidently throughout your career came into it long yeah. before broadcasting. When did realisation of what you had and could see and do come I, to you? I think that Eric Harrison, my youth team coach, um, it's how I watch a game. So uh, as a youth team player, he insisted that we watched, the, we watched every first team game at Old Trafford. And he insisted we watch the game through the eyes of our position. So if you're a fullback, watch Paul Parker and Dennis Irwin. I don't. So when the, even the ball's on the left wing, you, I want you to look at what they're doing and where they are. So I always looked at it from a point of view that it wasn't the ball that I was following. Yeah. I never followed the ball. They said, "Don't ball watch," you know. And then you become. I didn't believe one of my greatest strengths probably was. I don't think it was the quickest fullback. Um, I just don't think I was the best on the ball. But I think I, I read the game reasonably well. I very rarely got caught out of position. Um, I did do, obviously, but it, I, 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 the worst thing you could ever le I could ever think of would be that I would be in a bad position, that I wasn't in the right, right position to cover my, my centre back, or I wasn't in the right position to support my right winger, or you know, I, I, it happened quite a bit in my career. This is reading, reading, positioning, and, and position. constant alertness. Yeah, alertness, and how you watch a game. So how you watch a game is the bigger picture, what's happening, rather than following the ball. And I think a lot of people watch games, but they don't see the game. Mm. A lot of people watch the game but don't see the game. I, on Monday nights, when we do the Monday night football, I watch the big, we call it the boot room camera. It's the big um, bird's eye view of the whole pitch. And for the first 20 minutes, 15 minutes, I'll stand there and I'll watch the big camera and get a picture of the game. And then you might come sit back down when you've got a picture of the game and the patterns. And then if something changes on, that you see it on the screen that people are seeing at home, you might go back to the big screen and think, well, what's happened? And so you're looking at the game differently. You're looking at it as a coach. That's how a coach would look at the game. Um, it's how a manager would look at the game. See, one of the great shocks when you become a journalist and you go into a press box, you know, without being derogatory about Emery, you sit there and you're watching you're as a tent because you're new yeah. and you want to prove yourself. And all the old hats go, the, the ball goes in. And the first question is, who gave it to him? How did it happen? They haven't followed the game. They no. haven't remembered the game. No. I don't mean that in a derogatory way, but it proves your point that there, there are m multiple different ways to watch a game. Yeah. Now... Again, without getting too highfalutin, I think that what you're beginning to talk about and what you're doing on screen all the time is changing the way people watch it. In my lifetime, I've listened to people, punters, because yeah. that's who I think the majority, you know, we can't all be top quality footballers or broadcasters. People talk about games now in terms of strategy, yeah. particularly younger people. Yeah, yeah. Strategy, patterns <clears throat> from weeks previously, knowing what a manager does and doesn't like in terms of a formation or even how a formation might change during a game. Yeah. Now, you're influencing that. You must be conscious of the fact that although it's entertainment, although yeah. we want people to enjoy the goals and, and tune in to be entertained, there is a level of education or, or elevating the debate yeah. at least. I, I, I have no problem. I think once uh, half time, I think we spent four minutes on one corner, on one goal. I've got no problem with that. Because if you want to go and watch goals, go and watch the top 100 goals or Netbusters, whatever it is. These are the programmes that we have plenty of them at Sky, don't we? Where we show goals left, right and centre. Match of the Day, I think, is a fantastic highlight show that captures every single game, gets all the goals in. Monday Night Football is completely different. It's completely different. It's about detail. It's about analysis. And I think when I um, started, I took the view that I wasn't going to dumb down that analysis. Mm. So I... I think people at home watching are intelligent. They are. They do want to be informed. They're not just there to sort of see things that they've already seen at the weekend on another programme. They want something different. They want a more analytical view. And if they don't, then go and watch a different programme. Mm. I don't apologise for the fact that we might spend five minutes on a corner or a series of set pieces or just one pattern of play or one individual. I don't apologise for it. We're going to spend tonight, we're doing, I'm talking to you now, as we're going to do the Manchester derby, the 4-2 Manchester United versus City. And we're going to spend 20 minutes talking about that game. Just that game. Not showing highlights, just showing three aspects of that game. And I will not apologise for it. And I think people will find it either interesting or they'll think it's too much. And it's too much for some people. Mm. Some people sometimes, you know, I'll get on social media, get told everything. But the odd person will say, look, it's, it, it, you're overanalyzing over things here. And sometimes you think, well, are we overanalyzing things? And other people say that detail's fantastic. So one man's... Overanalyzing is another man's, if you like, fantastic detail. But we don't apologise for what it is. And I, I would never change. I could not... Punditry, I asked her, One thing that the Sky producer told me that does a show is you have to have a hook. So there has to be a hook. 
There has to be something that the public remember in the show. In each show, think mm -hmm. of one thing. One thing, whether one statement, one word, one phrase, uh, one piece of analysis. Because after, after an hour of analysis, they're only going to remember one thing, two things. And so we really work hard to try and get the best piece that we possibly can. Um, and it's a different type of show. I think the more detailed, it should be more coaching-led. It should be more analytical. It should be more for football fans who've got a real serious interest in when they go and watch the game next. I'm, I, they might pick that up. They might look at that and think, ah, yeah, so I can see that now. I couldn't see it before last week, and I hope that's happening. No, I, think, I mean, I think that's absolutely true, and it, it certainly, for all the time I've spent watching and learning and listening, when I tune in, sometimes I'll be riveted. I'll mm. stand up, I'll go up to the screen mm. because, and I'll tape it, or I'll, and I'll say, that, I, you know, it's like a light bulb. Mm. Because if you haven't played, or if you haven't been in the dressing rooms, or you haven't felt that pressure, you, you won't understand it all until you're taught it or shown it. But... On the show as well, and also on Super Sunday, and also in the Champions League analysis, one of the things I think that stands out about you is you, not alone, but you break the mould of footballers tend, I don't know how it's taught or why it happens, they tend to either try to agree with each other or if they disagree, they try to make it friendly. But if you have a, I know that there aren't disagreements staged, but no. it, it, what happens when people disagree on shows you're involved in is that the debate goes on, that the argument is fleshed yeah. out, and that's beneficial to everybody. What, one, do you agree that it's rare for footballers to do that, that footballers aren't comfortable in disagreeing with each other on screen? And if so, why, does that happen? why is that a no, trend? I think, to be fair, I think it comes from accountability and the fact that if you're comfortable with what you're saying, and um, I have no problem with disagreeing with... Um, I think the best shows are when we disagree or, or when there's debate. As long as it's thoughtful and it's not rants. And some shows now that I see, not necessarily, I see that it goes into rants. It's like who can come out with the wildest statement. There's not, that, it's always got to be, you can go on a rant or a passionate exchange, but it's got to be supported with a basis. by a basis of fact or analysis. And I always say that if there's a point going to be made and if you're going to go for something or someone or a team, you better be able to back it up with stats. And sometimes if I can't back it up with stats, I'll pull away from it a little bit. I'll, if I can't back it up with footage or stats or something, I think this could be seen as a rant. It's going too early. And there are times in the last two or three years where maybe I've gone a little bit too early or I've not done it quite right and I've not backed it up. But generally, more often than not, there's quite a simple rule that if you're going to be critical of someone, make sure you're right and make sure you're supported by the facts that back it up. And that's where I think patterns are important to me. Patterns of seeing things more than once. So when I see things once, I accept it as a mistake. When I see it twice, I think, hmm, there's a problem developing there because he, he's got it wrong twice or they've got it wrong twice. You see it three and four times, then that's it. You're in, two-footed, because ultimately <laughs> it's a problem. It's a pattern's developed of one, two, three, four times. It's a situation where you, as a coach, would have intervened on the training ground and said, Absolutely. I've seen that three, four times. Yeah. Now, what I want you to do is change your positioning yeah. or communication or whatever. Absolutely. I think in terms of the actual... Um, a one-off mistake you cannot be critical of. You can say it's a mistake, but I think when they repeat something once, twice, three, four times, you think there's a problem. You need to stamp that out. I think the only other time I think when, when you talk about punditry in the difficult times is when you get the real big moments that happen on, in broadcasting, the real massive moments, the Suarez bite, the Evra Suarez handshake and the Kenny Dalglish interview at Anfield, the Aguero goal, um, uh, but more often not the disciplinary ones um, and I, 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 it was tough when I first started to understand how to play these ones out and the, the, the simple rule that I gave myself was right, everyone's going mad social media's gone crazy this is going to be all over the back pages of the paper it's going to go worldwide you're the first person that's going to speak on it what are you going to say? Might be the second person if there's someone else in the studio with you. And I always take myself back into the changing room and think, right, you're a player. You're a player. Did you do this? Did your teammate do this? Did your manager do this? Probably more often than not, in 20 years of playing at United, there were incidents that will have happened that something similar. A disciplinary incident, uh, a moment of madness. And you think, right, how did you behave? How did you react? How did you see it at that point? And then it enables me to put some sort of, uh, what's the word, balance and think, 
don't go over the top. It's easy to go over the top. Suarez should be kicked out of the country because he bit somebody. And I went straight away, ah, Cantona. <laughs> I remember those moments, you know, me kicking, a fan, me kicking a ball in the face of an Everton fan, celebrating too much against Liverpool. All those moments where I potentially let myself down in my career and you think, he got carried away, didn't he? He got carried away, he has got a problem, he needs to correct it, he's got an issue. But actually, does he deserve to stop playing football forever or be kicked out of a country? No. No, and then that's where I think try and bring balance. I think you've always got to retain that credibility and balance. Would the change room respect you for what you're going to say? I think that's important when you're in punditry. Not that you're trying to sort of feather your nest with players or with managers, but you can't lose the change room as a pundit. As soon as players disrespect you, managers disrespect you, the fans won't be far behind. The fans won't be far behind because they'll just switch off. So in other words, it's, it's important to shrug off that I can't criticise them because I was one of them recently. It's important to say honestly what you're saying, keep a calm head, say it calmly. But if you have to say something tough, then you broach that, you just do it. Yeah, you have to do yeah. it. You can, you, but that was a process that you had to think about. To, yeah. Not the process of honesty and lack of hypocrisy that you've identified yeah. there, but... Talking you, about a fellow pro you're always, in a difficult situation. You're, you're always balancing. That is the great balance of where do you pitch this? Mm. How, bad, how bad a mistake is it? For instance, I'll give you an example. Kevin Morales, he took a penalty off uh, Leighton Baines on a Monday night football three, four months ago. And I used the word a despicable breach of team spirit. And at the time, uh, Everton fans felt that went too far, I think, on social media. I don't think I went far enough. I think, to me... If I can think of any, if there isn't anything worse, so I think you could punch somebody, you could elbow somebody, you could make a really bad mistake as a player, you could, but to actually go and be selfish and risk and break team orders, I, that's something I couldn't stand. I, I, and I, I don't hold back from that. And it happened again. I would, but I know, you, you, what you've always got to recognise is if, if, if you say it once with Kevin Morales, it happens again with another player, it's the same. It's the same, got to be the same response. So that's a time whereby someone might think, well, how do I pitch this? And I thought long and hard about it, and I thought, do you know something? If that had happened in a Manchester United changing room, all hell would have broken loose. Someone taking a penalty off a teammate at a critical point in the game when your name's up on the board to say you're the penalty taker. You don't do that. So I think they're the sort of thing, where do you pitch things? The Suarez one, does he get kicked out of the country? Is it a 30-game ban? Is it whatever it's going to be? Mm. No, I don't think he should be kicked out of the country. I think he should be punished. I think he'll be a heavy ban. But no, he definitely shouldn't be kicked out of the country. We definitely should work with him to try and rehabilitate him, to try and work with him to make sure he doesn't happen again. And that's where I pitched that one. Other times, you might just get it slightly wrong. I remember, I think, Gareth Barry uh, didn't block a ball once in an Everton-Manchester City game. And I called it disgraceful. I thought, come back, words. Mm -hmm. Come back. It wasn't disgraceful. <laughs> it was poor, but it wasn't disgraceful. And that... That that's the bit where you're sort of always looking to try and pitch something in a balanced way that what would the dressing room say? What would the dressing room say? What would the coach or manager say that was being reasonable to his player? Yeah, that was poor. That was disgraceful. That's despicable. So it's always about a word and the use of it and how you play it and how you justify it. But on the pitch as, a, as an athlete and a footballer, you're reaching for decisions and you're reaching yeah. for skills. And a golfer in the Masters last night, you're reaching for yardages and clubs. Reaching for words under pressure, reaching for... Different grades of words. It's extraordinarily tough. If, if you're only coming out of a season calling back four or five phrases, mm. three phrases, it's, it's, yeah. it's astronomically good. It, it, it is about... Yeah, you're absolutely right. It is, it, it's where you're pitching it. Sometimes you can have a team that's absolutely fantastic. And you know, I, the amount of players I get heard called geniuses. <laughs> he's magic. He's a genius. Yeah. He's a magician. No, he's not. <laughs> There's nowhere to go from there. There's nowhere to go from genius. There's yeah. nowhere to go from magician. There's nowhere to go from... Uh, you know, there's n these words leave you no room for... So I watched I watch Messi play against um, Manchester City in the new Camp and I was genuinely, for the first time, I think, in my football career, I can think of maybe Ronaldo a couple of times at United where I was watching injured in 2007-8 where I was probably similarly mesmerised. But I was genuinely, as a broadcaster, the only time I've ever watched a performance where I've been genuinely mesmerised by a player was Messi for the 20 minutes before half-time in the new Camp against Manchester City. I was like, and I've seen him before, and I've seen him on the television, and you know, I've seen him live many times, as you have. But I was genuinely thinking, this is 
as good as it's ever going to be. Yeah. This, this, I'm happy to use, every, I call it a scandalous, it's scandalous talent. It's out of this world. And people on social media will tell you, well, oh, you, you're bullying him up to it. You cannot go, that's the point where I just thought, I have to go for it. But it's the only time. But once you've used that for him, everything else is below that. Everything else, every word, you, know, you can't again go and call, you know, with respect, watching a player at Burnley Tottenham last week, you can't go and call him scandalous talent mm. or a genius because you've called Messi that. So I always like to think where I pitch things is relative generally through. And that's difficult. It is difficult to get that right, I think. You really struck me in what you wrote after that game because I, I suspect that because I, I'm evangelical about what I've seen mm. in Spain over recent years, I'm aware that you can be seen or be felt to force adjectives or passion down people's throats yeah, yeah. and that it can come across as everything in Spain's great when it isn't yeah, yeah. and it's cyclical it's France in 98 and then it's been different. but has watching football as, as an analyst as a co-commentator as somebody who breaks things down watching football more widely that, I mean I know your playing experience couldn't have been more wide in terms of World Cups and European yeah. Champions, Champions League but clearly it's a different thing you do on the pitch, even when you're watching injured, than it is uh, as an analyst and a co-commentator. Now, you've been watching lots more Champions League football, more foreign teams, and watching it in a different way, rather than guarding your position, you've been analysing all matches. Has it changed? Has it opened up your mind about football? A hundred percent. You know, it, it, four years ago, I made the very clinical decision that I wasn't going to take a coaching role, that I was going to watch football. I'd only ever seen Manchester United, and teams probably... Uh, People say, oh, I watched all the games on television. Of course I did. But, and this is, this is watching a game live analytically and watching a game on television through television pictures, which is fantastic and we all love it because it brings the colour to the event, is completely mm. different. You cannot analyse a game through television. You cannot. You, it's impossible. Unless you've got the big camera, it's impossible to do it. So I wanted to go and watch every single different type of football that I possibly could over a three, four, five year period. That was my complete... One, I wanted to obviously... I was um, privileged and honoured to be offered the job here at Sky and the fact that they were telling me that I would work on the fantastic matches and the top matches. I was doing Monday Night Football. Um, that was great. But the idea of watching all these different types of football, lower Premier League teams, middle Premier League teams, obviously the top Premier League as well, but all the Champions League games, be able to go on to Munich, Madrid... All the different cities, Barcelona, um, Turin, Milan, all the places I've been over this last four years to watch all the matches that I never would have watched if I'd been a coach at a club. And you change all the time. But it ends. you end up finding yourself as what your beliefs are in football. Mm. And Barcelona, over that first couple of years of my Sky career, probably the greatest team that's ever lived in most people's eyes and in my eyes. But it's not my... They don't meet my principles on football. I, 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 you Your know, Borussia Dortmund team of that 12 to 18 months, the first Bayern Munich team under Heinkes, mm -hmm. they were more aligned to, yeah, I get that, that that's me, I, that's what, that's what I like. Tell me why. Um, I think the Barcelona principles philosophy is unique to them. Mm -hmm. I think it's unique to them. And don't get me wrong, there are parts of their game which absolutely you'd love to have in aspects of your game. So the pressing from the front that they mm -hmm. did under, under, under Pep, so all those things you think, well, of course I want teams that are going to press from the front. But the endless possession, the constant possession, I believe in possession, but I don't believe in constant possession. I believe, I, I like the idea, I believe the Bayern Munich team, and I'm going to get my years right, wrong here probably, 2012 when they won the treble and they beat Dortmund in the final, where they had uh, Robin, Ribery, mm -hmm. um, Muller, Mandzukic, Martinez and Schweinsteiger. I think it's a better team than the one that Pep has now or the last year and this year. Better team, more balance. They could fight you. They could counter-attack on you. So that the great counter-attacks of Robin and Ribery that happened against Barcelona mm -hmm. couldn't happen now under Pep because they always have the ball. So some of the aspects that made them a great team have now been lost because of the way in which Pep's taken them. I actually think, and, uh, and probably most people would disagree with me, I think the best Barcelona team I saw was the first year of Pep, where they had Eto, Omri, Messi wide, uh, Iniesta, Busquets, Xavi, they had Puyol, um, 
Yaya Torre played centre back in the final with Gerard Piquet. But the physical aspect of that team with Eto'o, with Henri, was incredible. Puyol, Keita. Uh, Keita. I thought that they had such a physical presence. You couldn't fight them. Mm. You couldn't outdo them on set pieces. You couldn't. They, they would do you in every single way. They keep the ball. They're still a possession team, but they had other aspects. They had counter-attack. Could you call it a blend of what you a like blend. and what Pep yes. gives it? So I like the more rounded mm-hmm. team that is, if you like, I think the Bayern Munich team of Heinkes and the Barcelona team of Pep the first year, mm-hmm. for me, were rounded football teams. Whereas I think the Barcelona team that then evolved through Pep, where they won't beat United in the final the, the, the uh, year after, or two years after at Wembley, that was almost like football that I don't think probably can be recreated. And I think actually relies probably upon Messi to be successful. I might be wrong there. No, I understand. I think if you, if you, have, if you have 70% possession in the way in which they kept the ball, but then took Messi out, but I think that first team with Eto'o, uh, yeah, Henri... So many more I, solutions, I think so many put, more goals. Yeah, I think you could put Pedro on the right and they might still have won the Champions League. They might not, but they might still have won it. The second team, you take Messi out, I think it goes. Mm-hmm. And that's where I think the rounded team, so that's the bit that, you know, you over a four-year period, and that, it feels like I'm being critical of probably the greatest football team you could ever w- wish to see, but it, in terms of my principles of what I've liked, the Dortmund, the Brian Mead, or the, or the first Barcelona team, had, I think, I think United, I'm, I, I might be wrong here, I think the, the, the possession in the wrong final was 50-50. This is where you. We, the, the brutal thing for me is that I'm going to let you go before you say you've got to go. But you, 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 all my synapses are leaping now because the possession was balanced in Rome, and I've never seen. An, I grew up in Aberdeen, and therefore, I, you know, I met Alec quite young and, and watched his teams, and they inspired me and they changed my thinking. And one of the things they give you is competitiveness, aggressiveness. There are no boundaries. There are no limits. You, and he said that um, the goal, the Eto goal, which was I think in nine or ten minutes, yeah. killed us. Yeah. I've never heard that from Alex Ferguson. Now, given that the game possession was relatively balanced and that Barcelona didn't create a mountain no, of chances no. until that ball from Xavi to Messi for the goal, that was one of the most confusing games and aftermaths I've ever seen. Mm. And clearly, Barcelona kept the ball. Maybe United didn't look as sharp. Maybe the midfield was easier for yeah. Barcelona with the space that they had, whatever. It, it, it's still, to me, it's a confusing game, mm. a confusing analysis. Yeah. It's, it's why United weren't more competitive or couldn't win the ball no. in dangerous situations, press and take it and break mm. against a team it, where Iniesta was hobbling. Yeah, yeah, That's yeah, the I, amazing yeah, thing. I think Omri and Iniesta both were doubts for the final. We, 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 we weren't expecting Iniesta to play. But I, I think that game, that was a team that I feel didn't have to be probably at its best to win 2-0, that Barcelona team. It had a real physical physicality to it. It had a... They were tough. You felt they were, you felt they were tough enough to mix it with United. Yeah. Um, and I'm not saying for any way, shape, or form that the Barcelona teams in the two years after that were soft, because they weren't soft. Because I mean, the courage to play and 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 the way in which they defended. I mean, it, but they did get pushed around by Henkes in that time when the breaks yeah, that you're talking about yes. when it's seven 0 And I don't think that team the first time. And I always think there's something about even the Bayern team. I think it'd be very difficult. I think Bayern Munich could easily win the Champions League mm-hmm. under Pep. They could easily mm-hmm. do it. But it'd be very difficult for them to recreate the power, mm-hmm. quality, possession, counter-attacking, all the different aspects, good defending, that they re- had in that first Champions League success. I think that's as good as it gets. When you look at a team sometimes, like the 1999 team, it comes to that point whereby everything's right. Mm-hmm. The power, the possession, the goals, the defending, the counter-attack. You, a team just has everything. And that's the 1999 team. That's the 2000. And Nine Barca team, the mm-hmm. two thousand, I think it was twelve Bayern team, and they're the sort of rounded teams. So it's not just that, that, that to me is what I sort of look at. And think, I mean, I'm sure everyone's loved these teams, but that's why I say I don't like the pure Barcelona team. Yeah. I like the one that was slightly flawed. Yeah, in, you know, less totally polished. understood. And right now, there's a debate in Barcelona amongst the purists whether they be pundits or fans saying, oh, "Hold on a second, we're now using the ball from free kicks to scoring goals from free kicks there." Um, using the ball more directly in the country. They don't like that. It's, so there's a, it's not as good because some of the players are older, but they really don't like There's no. more of a blend now. It's similar to 2009. And people are tearing their hair out in Catalonia. It, it, it's a scandal. It's funny. It's funny that I actually saw them against Manchester City and enjoyed them again. Yeah. And thought that makes sense the to Suarez, the, the Neymar, the Messi back out wide. Yeah. I just felt like the Rakitic in midfield, it felt a little bit less polished, but it felt a little bit tougher, a little bit... No doubt. I, it, 
it's not, I mean, they, they were like clockwork for two years, weren't they? They, they never gave the ball away. I don't think they made a bad pass. But then I felt as though the risk was back in the game again and the, the excitement was back in the game again and the, the thrill of the entertainment was back in the game and watching them against City, whereas it, was, it wasn't just a sort of keep, of keep it at all costs. It was, well, that's going to take risks. We're going to do things that maybe risk giving the ball away. That gives City a little bit of a chance. Yeah, City had a couple of counter-attacks. But I just felt as though they're on the way to... They're probably a couple of players... I don't think they'll win the Champions League this season. They might, but I don't think they will. They, they might. I think they'll just fall short. But I think they're a couple of players, one or two players away from winning it again. I think they're close again. But I'm not sure they'll win it. And that's, that's I mean, I'm talking in April, where they've still got... They're only a couple of eight games away from, from winning it. I'll, I'll go out and let me say that. I, I share your point of view, that they're yeah. probably a millimetre too short. Yeah. Although, on a day when Messi plays, really plays, they and Neymar really plays, you never know. Could, yeah. We've reached a position where we're drawing to a close, but we've also reached a compromise, whereby... We agree that the, some of the, the technique and intelligence and strategy of what we've experienced in Spain, not just Barcelona in recent years, but other values that we like here about competitiveness, directness, tackling, team spirit, mm. aggression, all these kind of things w- would provide a perfect blend that you've identified in the Hankers treble, but I, I still aspire, albeit I'm a Scot, that we could see in English football a transfusion of the things that we've learned and that you're starting to talk about on television from mm. the Spanish game or some of the parts of Germany, France, to what we do traditionally well. And one of the things to tie up that's missing is something you wrote about, which I call devolved intelligence on the pitch. And you wrote in periods of uncertainty in games, the players at European clubs, these elite European clubs, are better at adapting. And too often players have to wait until halftime when coaches can get rid of them, they get hold of them. Mm. Player thinking is really poor. Problem solving, which is an expression you used before, yeah. you used before is really poor. Yeah. Th- this, why do we lack devolved intelligence on the football pitch in our players? Um, my gut feeling at the moment is that is that are we coaching teams right? Are we coaching them to be leaders? Are we are, are are players analysing their own performances post-match, pre-match? Are they breaking down the individual parts and getting those... That, that, that sort of, is, is the information sinking in to them of how things went wrong so that next time it happens on the pitch, they know how to put it right? And it's building up that bank of patterns and thinking, I've been here before and next time I'm there, I'm not going to do it again. And that might be where a left winger from a right back, a left winger plays in a certain position that caused me a problem. Why did it cause me a problem? Not just to come off the pitch and think, that was difficult today, it caused me a problem. And then next week you play against a completely different team, it's gone away, but then in six months' time that problem will come again and you think, oh, hang on a minute, I didn't work out how to actually correct that problem last time. And that's football for me. So never leave a problem hanging. And I always felt as though when I had a problem in a game, I wanted to know where the problem came from, how it came. And I genuinely think the players... That I played with at United as well. They really were thinkers. They, they, they generally, when you're at a top club, a Manchester United, and you, you, you're sailing like we were, or Barcelona, or Bayern Munich, you win 95% of your games just by playing your game. But then there'll always be that 5% of matches that will pose you the problem, and something will happen. And you, you must think, ask yourself why. Yes, why, and not leave it hanging as if to say, well, well that won't happen again for six months. Deal with it and think and build that, that bank of knowledge and teach yourself how to correct your mistake. And so the next time it happens, and it's not necessarily your, you that has to change. It could be if I'm a right back, I might need my central midfield player to be in a different position, or my right winger to be in a different position. So I might have to get him on the strings and pull him into a different area of the pitch that he normally would go to correct the problem that I'm having. Now there's a danger with that, that you become then someone who potentially, but I see it quite, I see it so many times where a full back is getting, and I always use this example, a full back is getting skinned off a winger and he doesn't get his mate back to help him for 20 minutes, his right winger. Say, look, mate, forget your attacking, forget this bit of the game, I'm getting done here. Come back here, sit on my toes, stop this, and then we'll deal with the attacking bit in a short while, or we'll let someone else win the game for us today. That's sacrifice, that's choice, it's things that you make, it's decision, problem solving. It doesn't necessarily always have to be, well, God, he doesn't have to start. It, 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 once a winger beats you once, you can be pretty sure his confidence is up, and he's going to think, I'm going to beat you again. So... Unless you stamp on him next time and next time and next time and you demoralise him from him beating you, 
there is always a risk that once you've been beaten once, you might have to start thinking about doing something different. And I'm not sure that that thinking that goes on in the pitch. Now, that set piece is one of the big ones. So you, I'm, every team will do it. They'll have the, the set piece board up in the changing room. They'll have all the markers. They'll have all the positions for where attacking wide free kicks, defending wide free kicks, attacking corners, defending corners. But then all of a sudden on the pitch, a player that you thought might come in or a player who wasn't supposed to come in will come in because that's football because the other team have planned differently. You haven't got their set pieces and they might change. They might, And then all of a sudden you'll just see players, oh, my man's not come in. Yeah, but there must be someone else somewhere then, or where do you need to be? <laughs> but they don't. It, it generally doesn't happen. That's what I'm talking about. That right, my man's not here. My number six is not here. Well, okay, who, there's somebody else must be. Oh, there's no one else free. Okay, where can I be now then? There must be an extra man at the edge of the box, which means that they've got three at the edge of the box. We've only got two, so now they're outnumbering us there. And it, that thinking, that drives me potty. That must drive you off the I off ju- the wall. I, that thinking does not go on. That thinking does not go on. It, in 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 oh, it does in some teams. But the problem solving does not go on. It genuinely doesn't. And that's something that really disappoints me because it's not thinking about your job. It's not, um, it's not being able to adapt. All right, the way out of this for you is to tell me, because we both know that the way to correct that long term is development. How yeah. you teach children, boys or girls, who are playing at all levels about intelligence, about yeah. decision making, and about consequences, about teammates, about yeah. In the meantime, can you graft it in? The Premier League is famous for buying big players and giving mm. them huge rates. Can you graft it in by buying Pep and Klopp and taking Ancelotti back and replicating what Mourinho's doing at Chelsea? Not foreigners per se, because foreigners no, aren't better than no, Brits no. per se. We, I'm talking about the elite coaches yes, right now are absolutely. continental. I, 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 I think that there is massive missed opportunity. We, we, with, with the Premier League, and we've had some of the great coaches here over the last 15, 20 years, and we've had some of the great players... But Mourinho will leave one day and he'll have, he'll have loved the Premier League. And he'll have left an impact upon, say, Steve Holland is number two. Mm-hmm. But then, why? And I suppose it would be Chelsea's IP. But when I think of the Premier League and boosting English football, why wouldn't one session a week have to be filmed and then passed on to the coaches' programmes, the pro-licensed coaches? Love it. You know, the idea that we film a Ferguson session. I bet if you said now, go and get me 10 Sir Alex Ferguson sessions, they don't exist. Yeah. Or Kiros, uh, Carl's Kiros sessions or Steve McLaren sessions. I can think of some... Oh, I, I even think of Don Howe and Terry Venables, my first England coaches, and think of Don Howe's piece work or his defensive sessions, unit sessions he used to do with us. And I used to think, if only they now could be looked at. Mm-hmm. Some of the great minds and coaches over the last 25 years, the fact that it's not kept for use by English football, English coaches. I accept it's only made public, but the idea that the best coaches' sessions are made available to our developing coaches... The academies. Our, our academy, the coaches. B yeah. licence, A licence yeah. coaches. The idea that the best sessions are not kept, archived, maybe not used for three years, because obviously there might be some sort of... to that player manager's left the club or something like that. But to me, it's just a loss. Fantastic. It's a loss to English football... It's something that I think the Premier League could do to benefit English football, but also, you know, the foreign coaches that you mentioned, the idea of a, a Mourinho or um, a Wenger or other um, great coach, Benitez, whoever it's been that they've been over here, Van Gaal now. Let, let, let's learn from them. Brilliant. But we don't. We we come over here. The only people who's learning are Ryan Giggs, who maybe sees Louis Van Gaal every day. Steve Holland, who sees Mourinho every day. Um, Maybe a couple of lads at Liverpool who were there under Benitez or... Stevie Bold. Stevie Bold under Wenger. But that's it. Eight, six people. We could actually make 600 people, 800 people learn off these people. I think you've got Spanish blood in you because when I went to the Federation to ask them about the development work from youth level, when I went to Barcelona's Football Academy, they, they said to me, oh, we're, we're welcoming these guests over and we're going to go and speak at Burton. I don't know what Burton's called here. It's yeah, George's, George's Park. Park yeah. I said to them, what are you doing that for? You, you, they said the opposite. It's for better football. We're sharing because it's for the better of football, and you know they'll catch up. Yeah. These ideas shared will happen. By the time they've caught up, we'll have moved on a little bit. That, and they feel they've they said these things that are so alien to the culture here. We want to share. This is for the betterment yeah. of football. Some ideas we'll take, some won't. But of course, we'll go we, and lecture. We, we need real time development. I get the feeling sometimes that we sort of wait for a team to win the World Cup. <laughs> And then copy them. But the problem then is that they've already moved on from that yeah. to the next step and you're actually yeah. copying something that they implemented two, three years before. Yeah. So they've implemented that World Cup system strategy two, three years before 
and they've put it into their players. They've won the World Cup, but the problem is the next World Cup winners have evolved and they've got a new strategy and you're copying last time's yeah. strategy. Yeah. And that's a big problem. We've got to have real-time thinking that's innovative, that's creative, that's different. And I get the feeling we sort of jump on the bandwagon of you know, the idea of Barcelona centre-back split you almost got the feeling at times they were sort of stood in the stands on either side of the ground, they were that wide. And then the midfield player goes and drops in. And it's not the first time we've ever seen it being done before. We saw it, you know, Venables himself, I think, did it with England at times. But they went to such a deep extent, that level with a six-yard box. And all of a sudden, you would see some obscure centre-backs from a first division or championship club split into those positions thinking, the copying. But the copying people, they can't... It's like me saying I'm going to copy... Um, I love Noel Gallagher. I'm going to copy his songwriting. <laughs> but if I can't do it, there's no point in copying it. It's impossible for me to copy it. So why do we copy things we can't do or we're not capable of? Create our new idea. Create a new idea that's yours, that suits your players. Yeah. I get the feeling. I think Mourinho said that to me. It really hit home when I did an interview with him earlier on in the season. He called it copycat coaching. He said people go on Google now. And copy coaching sessions and think that they can become a coach. To create it. new fo- new thinking isn't happening. It's cut and paste. It's cut and paste. It's like, oh, we'll take a bit from him, a bit from him, a bit from him. We might get somewhere. But actually, what have you thought of yourself that's innovative, that might be different, that the players can hang on to? And it, it, but this is not just football. This is all walks of life and business, I think. Can I take you back to the reason that I asked you to do this? Yeah. That. Because yeah. that's what you're doing on the television. I told you you'd be uncomfortable at some of the things I said about you, <laughs> but you've just gone full circle to why I asked you to be a guest on this podcast, because that's what you and Jamie and Ed, in his own way, that's what you do. Um, so it's very enjoyable. Sometimes. And you might just save the world, so keep doing <laughs> what you're doing. Save the world. No, I won't do that. <laughs> Guy Neville, thank, thank you very much, much thank indeed. You. you see, I told you. He wouldn't agree with me, but he's a genius and he's doing his own original thinking. Um, There'll be more of that, I hope. Not the same tone, not the same anecdotes, but more people who talk about football and think about football with the same degree of uh, intelligence and fun. And we'll keep producing these podcasts over the coming weeks. The way to stay in touch with them, the way to keep up to date with the new guests we have, um, is to subscribe to the podcast. That way you won't miss a thing. And the way to do that is to keep up to date with GrahamHunter.tv, the website set up by my publishers, Backpage Press. This is their idea, too, Backpage Press. Neil White and Mark Gregg came up with this concept. Um, they didn't invent the podcast, but they invented me. And um, thank God for that. See you next time.